was an awkward high school student struggling with her sexuality. Carrie called me and she goes, you know, I think I'm gay. I like girls. She found acceptance and love in the arms of a popular upperclassman. Carrie Murphy and Rebecca Keller's relationship was consuming to both of them. I had never seen Carrie become so obsessed about a person ever. But their budding romance would be ripped apart by a horrifying crime. She had multiple stab wounds to her body. On her legs, on her arms, hands, neck, in the face. It was obvious that it was a very brutal attack. To uncover the truth, investigators would have to unravel a tangled web of lust, lies, and a betrayal too horrifying to be believed. She was having this affair that kind of raises suspicion. They are scheming this together. The obsession with being in love with each other drove them to do one of the darkest things that I can ever imagine. High school can be a difficult time for a lot of young people. That seemed to be especially true for 15-year-old freshman Carrie Murphy. She was kind of an outcast in a way. She looked a little different than everybody. Desperate for acceptance, Carrie had been willing to try anything to fit in. You can see that in a range of different Facebook and Instagram posts. There'd be some posts with boots and dresses and then some with sideways hats and tank tops. She went through a gothic stage, black fingernails, black eyeshadow, things like that. I really think she was just exploring and trying to find a place that she was comfortable with. Life hadn't always been so confusing for Carrie. Born and raised in Houston, Texas, she'd grown up in a loving middle-class family who adored her from day one. It was, in my eyes, the typical American dream childhood. Blue-collar dad, mom that worked eight to five, boy and a girl. She and I had a very open relationship. Carrie knew that she could talk to me about anything. Carrie also had a strong bond with her father, Don. Though her relationship with her mother, Marianne, was a bit more complicated. Marianne had always pushed both of her children to succeed. While that approach worked with Scott, Carrie found it harder to live up to her mother's expectations. She was trying to follow in my footsteps and find that same groove that I got into because school came easily to me and it didn't for her. She used to say, you know, Scott, I'm really getting tired of having to live up to your name. By the time Carrie started high school, her physical appearance had also become another source of anxiety. I do think as she got older, maybe closer to her teenage years, she was uncomfortable with her size. Carrie was never the small, petite, typical girl that, you know, teenage boys went after. But there was one boy at school who showed interest in Carrie, a fellow outsider named Zane. I knew Zane. I grew up with Zane. We lived in the same neighborhood. Zane was really like a rebel. He was more of like a mysterious type. Zane was a guy that she knew that was kind of weird in her eyes, that showed interest in her, that she wasn't at all interested in him. Once Carrie made her feelings clear to Zane, they were able to become friends. And their relationship gave Carrie the confidence she needed to find a social group where she felt truly accepted. She had been in the choir, and she made a lot of friends there. Most of her friends that she had, she met through, through the choir. And it was in choir practice that Carrie first laid eyes on the girl who would change her life forever. 19-year-old senior, Rebecca Keller. Her nickname was Bunny. She was very high-spirited, very funny. Rebecca was three to four years older than Carrie. They clicked immediately. It was an immediate draw towards each other. In Carrie's eyes, Rebecca seemed to be everything she wasn't. Cool, confident, and popular. 
what Rebecca didn't have were the things Carrie took for granted. She grew up in a trailer park. She didn't get along with her dad. Rebecca Keller's upbringing was probably the best that her parents could do and provide for her. They had a little less income. They lived in a little poorer community. Rebecca wasn't provided the things that Carrie was. When Rebecca noticed Carrie's formidable singing chops, she took the shy freshman under her wing. Carrie was thrilled to be accepted by a popular upperclassman. But Rebecca told Carrie she was interested in being more than just friends. Rebecca had told me that she was bisexual. Rebecca's flirtatious advances caught Carrie by surprise. Not because they made Carrie feel uncomfortable, but rather because the attraction was mutual. At 15 years old and your hormones are going crazy and you don't know what you're really feeling and this is, you know, there was her comfort. She goes, well, Scott, I think I'm gay. I like girls. I was like, okay, well, that's, that's fine. It's, you know, whoever treats you well, that's what matters. When she finally found someone that gave her that love and affection, Carrie drew towards it as something she had never had before. And once Carrie and Rebecca's friendship turned romantic, the couple's bond only intensified. Carrie Murphy and Rebecca Keller's relationship was consuming to both of them. This may have been Carrie Murphy's first relationship with anyone in a romantic sense. And she fell head over heels. I had never seen Carrie become completely and utterly infatuated with a single person. She may not have ever had someone like that in her life before that was just so accepting of exactly who she was. While Carrie's brother, Scott, had understood her feelings, Carrie worried her parents, especially her mother, Marianne, wouldn't be as accepting. So at first, Carrie tried to keep her romance with Rebecca a secret from mom and dad. Carrie did the normal teenage thing where she would sneak out or she would, oh, I'm going to the movies with my friends, but she was meeting up with Rebecca. They lived a short distance from the house, so if she ran and did something, she could run over there and see her. But after several months of dating, Rebecca encouraged Carrie to come out to her mother and father. She didn't want to hide or feel like she had to be in a closet somewhere. She just wanted to be open and be happy about it. When she finally came out to our parents, I think she was a lot more comfortable with that. She felt a lot better about being her. To Carrie's surprise, both her parents seemed OK with the news. Mom did have a small learning curve on learning to deal with her daughter being in a homosexual relationship because her mom was very old fashioned. But she understood this is what made her daughter happy. Rebecca and Carrie even began planning for a future together beyond high school. Carrie had different versions of it. I can go to work, she can go to work, and we can be a normal couple. And then it was drastic things like moving away to California where gay marriage was accepted. It all involved being with Rebecca for life. And Rebecca reciprocated those feelings. But before any of Carrie and Rebecca's plans could materialize, their young lives would be turned upside down by a vicious crime. Sunday night, July 15, 2012. Carrie's father and brother are both working the night shift. And she and her mother, Marianne, are home alone. At 1.06 a.m., 911 dispatch receives a frantic call from the Murphy residence. On the line is Carrie. She told the 911 operator that someone had kicked in the back door and that she then heard her mother screaming that she ran out of the house. She had fled the scene to the neighbor's house. So the dispatch and first responders treated it as an active break-in at that time. So officers arrive on scene and the first priority is security. Carrie had come outside and said that her mother was still inside. But when the officers respond, they don't know if there's any suspects in the house. They entered through the back door, which was already open, and 
then they systematically go through the house. Inside, the officers find no trace of Marianne or the alleged intruder until they reach the back bedroom. They went in and found uh, Mary Murphy in her bedroom. She was found deceased laying on her bed, and she had multiple stab wounds to her body. Coming up, as Carrie mourns the loss of her mother, detectives attempt to track down the killer and uncover their motive. She was asleep in her bed, and they targeted her directly. This was someone who was angry. There was passion behind whatever happened in here. It's the spring of 2012, and 16-year-old Carrie Murphy has been swept off her feet by her first love, 20-year-old Rebecca Keller. Carrie and Rebecca were, they were obsessed. They were completely and utterly intertwined with each other, with every aspect of life. But Carrie and Rebecca's happiness is soon eclipsed by a terrifying crime when Carrie's mother, Mary Ann, is found brutally murdered inside the Murphy's home. She was in the master bedroom of the home. She was covered in blood. Upon learning that her mother is dead, Carrie is beside herself, as is her brother, Scott. I was at work. I worked the graveyard shift. I get a phone call from my sister's phone. She says, uh, Scott, someone broke into the house. Mom's dead. Uh, dropped everything I had in my hands, and uh, I started to panic. I didn't know whether to be sad, whether to be angry. I wanted to know who, when, why. I, did. I wanted to you know, cry and scream at the same time. I called my father to let him know that he needed to come home, so he started heading this way. With both Carrie's father and brother en route, Harris County investigators begin processing the crime scene. There was just numerous, numerous wounds to her body all over, on her legs, on her arms, hands, neck, in the face, on her chest, and uh, numerous severe slashes to the neck. It was obvious that it was a very brutal attack. Underneath Marianne's pillow, police find an unfired 22 caliber pistol. It was found wedged under her pillow. And my first indication was she just sleeps with it there just for safety. Me and my sister were raised around guns. That little pistol, Marianne knew how to use it. And that was the first line of defense. Grab it if you need it. The fact that Marianne never grabbed her gun suggests she'd been ambushed while she slept. But why would anyone want her dead? There was no indication that it would make me suspect somebody came in to do a home invasion or a robbery. A true home invasion is to break into a home and to steal something. And there was nothing stolen from this house. In fact, it seems the mysterious assailant had entered the home with only one intention, to kill Marianne Murphy. There's a back window. That window was broken. There were bricks and some glass from the window that was on the ground, indicating the brick was thrown through it. Someone was able to get into that house, was able to go to where Marianne was. They knew where she was. She was no threat. She was asleep in her bed, and they targeted her directly. Detective Craig Clopton takes Marianne's daughter, Carrie, aside for questioning. She made the 911 call, and she was the only person at home at the time. So they listened to what she had to say and had to investigate her theory of what, what happened. Carrie told me she had been up in the dining room scrapbooking, got tired, and went to bed, and wasn't in her bedroom very long before she heard a crash. And she says that someone had kicked in the back door and that she then heard her mother screaming. Carrie says that once she heard her mother screaming, she fled the house and went to her neighbor's yard across the street. She ran out and called 911 from across the street. She stayed with some witnesses who let her use their phone until the police arrived. 
which was only a couple of minutes later. While CSIs continue to process the crime scene, Detective Clopton takes Carrie back to the station where they are joined by Carrie's father, Don, and her brother, Scott. Don Murphy and his son, Carrie's brother, Scott, came down to the office and uh, were interviewed there. He wanted to find out what was going on. Neither Don nor Scott can think of anyone who would want to hurt Marianne. But as Detective Clopton talks with both men, he takes special notice of how Don Murphy appears to be responding to his wife's death. Initially, upon meeting him, he didn't seem terribly disturbed by finding out that his wife was killed. He just didn't seem bothered by it. Speaking with the Murphy's neighbors, police learn that Don and Marianne might have been having problems in their marriage. I knew that he drank and that he oftentimes slept in the living room, which indicated that there may be a rocky relationship. Is it possible Marianne's husband had something to do with her murder? Detectives take a closer look at his alibi. His alibi was that he was at work. That was easily confirmed through his job that he was there. While Don Murphy seems to be in the clear, detectives do uncover another eyebrow-raising detail about the marriage. They got the phone records from Marianne's, her own phone, and they realized that she had communicated on her phone with another male individual. The number belongs to a man who worked with Marianne. She was an employee with uh, DPS, Department of Public Safety, for a long time. And apparently, Marianne's relationship with her co-worker hadn't been exclusively professional. But at some point, she started having an affair with this gentleman. When I initially found out that she was having this affair, that kind of raised a suspicion. Marianne and this other individual had some form of relationship, and that person was the last person she spoke to. Coming up, as detectives take a closer look at Marianne's affair, the case is turned upside down by an unexpected confession. She eventually comes back, and she's like, he wants to tell you that he did it. Carrie Murphy might have been spending time with her girlfriend, 20-year-old Rebecca Keller. But on June 16, 2012, a mysterious intruder entered the Murphy residence and murdered her mother, Mary Ann, by stabbing her more than 70 times. Police already have a suspect in mind a co-worker of Mary Ann's with whom she'd allegedly been having an affair. They had a sexual relationship, an extramarital affair. In cases like this, would that be a potential avenue that you wanted to check out? Yes. Detectives track down Mary Ann's lover, but the man appears to be genuinely upset to learn of her murder and says he's willing to help investigators any way he can. He seemed very forthcoming. He said that, you know, they'd been having a relationship, that it was strictly sexual. They would send nudie photos back and forth. He had never been to her house. He never struck me as he was hiding anything. Every question, he was no problem, no problem. This is my phone, this is my phone number. While examining his phone, Police realized that Mary Ann's lover also had an airtight alibi. Through his phone records, ultimately let me know exactly where he was, that he had never been anywhere close to the scene. The investigation is back to square one. So police turn back to the last person known to have seen Mary Ann Murphy alive, her daughter, Carrie. In reviewing Carrie's story, police find several things that don't line up with the evidence at the crime scene. There was glass from a window from the back door that was broken. 
and the glass was on the wrong side. So if you were breaking in, you would expect to see the glass on the inside of the home, where in this case it was on the outside. Investigators in the crime scene unit are confident that this is not a break-in, that this looks like a staged scene. The most troubling inconsistency has to do with when Carrie called 911. She called 911 and said that someone had broken in her house, was assaulting her mother, and that she ran out and called 911 from across the street. First responders saw the scene, saw the blood. Some of that blood appeared to have been there for more than immediate time, that there was some coagulation happening. The coagulated blood suggests a significant gap between the attack on Mary Ann and the time that Carrie called police. The timeline doesn't match. We know how long it took for the deputies to get there and go inside and find your mother that would have been within minutes after you said you heard your mother scream. Investigators suspect that Carrie is hiding something. I hadn't formulated an opinion as to what her involvement was, but I knew that she knew something. So I wanted to get her tied in on a recorded statement. With the permission of Carrie's father, Don, investigators sit down with the 16-year-old for a formal interview. When she's pressed by detectives for details about the timing of events, the fact that there was no forced entry, she then begins to switch her story. She took a polygraph test and didn't do well on that. At that point, I'm more confrontational. I'm just downright telling her, I know you're lying. I know you know what happened. With her back against the wall, Carrie breaks down and admits she knows who killed her mother. She said, well, there's this guy. His name is Zane. Zane is Carrie's friend from school. She said it was him. She said, when I heard the door kicking in, before I left out, I heard them in the room talking, and I could recognize Zane's voice. But why would Zane kill Marianne? And why would Carrie try to cover for him? According to Carrie, it all stemmed from her complicated relationship with her mom and her romance with Rebecca Keller. Apparently, Marianne Murphy hadn't been as tolerant of Carrie and Rebecca's relationship as everyone thought. She didn't agree with the age difference between Carrie and Rebecca, and she voiced that opinion very often and very bluntly. It wasn't about the fact that her daughter was seeing another girl. It was the fact that Rebecca was not the best influence. Mom could see the obsessions beginning, and she didn't feel that it needed to continue. Mom was, she was so concerned with making sure that we did succeed and that we did go where we needed to go. She didn't want us to have any connections that held us back. She drew the line, and it was no more. You are not allowed to see her anymore. But Carrie tells detectives that she disobeyed her mother's request. Carrie would lie to Marianne a lot. Once Marianne would go to sleep, she would go in and steal Marianne's keys and take off with her car. Marianne was going to punish her, took her phone from her. Marianne also grounded Carrie, which meant she could no longer see or communicate with Rebecca. So Carrie decided to reach out to her friend Zane. According to Carrie, a couple days before the murder, she asked Zane if he could help her figure out a way to get out of being grounded. Carrie had solicited him to come to the house and beat on the wall to scare the mom. And Carrie's idea to scare her mom had to do with an incident that occurred at their house a few nights earlier. And one night, Carrie's mom caught Carrie outside. Carrie Murphy's lie at that time is there was a strange suspect around the house, so I was really just out of the house looking for this suspect. Carrie's mother knew that was a lie and grounded her daughter. But Carrie had come up with an idea to get out of being in trouble. So she wanted Zane to come and knock on the wall of her bedroom and 
run off so that the mom would think, hey, there is somebody suspicious outside. So maybe Carrie was telling me the truth about why she went out and she won't be punished. But Carrie claims that when Zane showed up that night, he barged into the house with a knife and took their plan to scare Marianne to an unthinkably gruesome level. She's admitting to, yeah, I knew this guy was gonna come over my house, but I didn't know he was gonna murder my mom. And I lied about it because I knew he was coming over. Is Carrie telling the truth? To find out, investigators bring Zane down to the station for questioning. Seated across from detectives, Zane seems confused and comes across much more like a frightened teenager than a cold-blooded killer. Zane also tells investigators he doesn't know anything about Marianne Murphy's murder. He initially was, yeah, I know Carrie, but the night of the murder, I was at home. I don't even know where Carrie stays. And this kid just, to me, he didn't seem bright enough to, to do that. So we were going to let him go home. I didn't feel confident in charging him. But before Zane is released, Detective Clopton asks him to take a polygraph. We give him a polygraph so that nobody else can question, well, did you give him a polygraph? And for that only reason, not that I thought he was lying to me. A polygraph examiner takes Zane into another room to administer the test. She's gone with him for a while, longer than normal. She eventually comes back and she's like, hey, he's ready to confess to you. He wants to tell you that he did it. According to the examiner, Zane had abruptly changed his tune in the middle of the test. He's saying he, there was an accident, he just got scared. Zane tells police that for some reason he decided to take a knife with him to the Murphy residence that evening. Initially, he didn't think he was going to use it, but as he was standing over Marianne, she suddenly woke up. He said that she woke up and startled me, and I just panicked, and I stabbed her. It's a startling confession and a stunning turn of events. I'm like, wow, this is a new one on me. Sometimes you call them wrong. Coming up police grow increasingly suspicious of Zane's confession. I don't think he knew what was going on. I've got to prove that he did this or didn't. And as a possible motive comes into focus, evidence suggests there might have been more than one killer. I know that there was a plan. They are scheming this together. investigation into who killed Marianne Murphy has been rocked by an unexpected confession. A friend of Marianne's daughter named Zane has just taken credit for the murder. He's saying it was an accident. He just got scared. He said that she woke up and startled me and I just panicked and I stabbed her. But something about Zane's admission of guilt doesn't sit right with investigators. From the moment they'd first sat down with Zane, he'd come across as confused and possibly even impaired. He knew that he was arrested, but I don't think he knew what was going on. Detectives suspect Zane might just be telling them what he thinks they want to hear. To test that theory, detectives put him through another round of detailed questioning. I've got to prove that he did this or didn't. He initially told me he doesn't even know where she lives. It's okay, well, Zane, if you did this, tell me, how do you get to her room? He made a remark about having to walk up a flight of stairs to get to Marianne's room, and they lived in a one-story house. I say, Zane, stop lying. If you've been over there, you know exactly where the room is. On top of the logistical holes in Zane's story, his parents are also adamant that their son is innocent. They tell police that their son was at home and playing video games on the night of the murder. And they have proof. 
there was a photograph of him there at the house. And we were able to corroborate that it was an actual photograph and had not been manipulated. He was at home with his family the night that Marianne was killed. But if Zane was innocent of the crime, why had he confessed? He says he gave a statement to Sergeant Clopton because he thought he would be released and he could go home. This is a suspect who is not of an average intelligence. So he was a little bit intimidated by the whole process. With all of that information, we decided to dismiss his charges. Then we began our investigation further into who actually committed the murder. And in detectives' minds, the person who had been lying to police from the get-go was Carrie Murphy. Little lies become big lies. And detectives, in this case, were great at pressing those little lies. And she continued to believe that she could outsmart them by changing her story. Detectives turn back to Carrie, demanding answers. But this time, they find the teen less willing to cooperate. So at that point, she's asked for an attorney. I have, it has to cease, so that interview stopped right then. With Carrie stonewalling, detectives reach out to her brother Scott for help. Scott reiterates that their mother was hoping to put a stop to Carrie and Rebecca's relationship because of their age difference, as well as Carrie's extreme fixation on Rebecca. When things started taking a turn with my mother's acceptance of the relationship, it was more based on the obsession. That's when mom started to have a bad taste for the relationship. But according to Scott, that wasn't all. Just days before the murder, their mother had discovered some racy text messages. Carrie had been texting back and forth. They had been sending nude photos as well. The text messages were not something a mother of a 16-year-old girl expected to find on a phone. They were quite intimate. That was a turning point with Carrie as far as you know, trying to work with mom on things. And that was a turning point with mom on trying to work with Carrie because it was against her wishes. You know, this is a mom who is taking care of her and loved her and done everything she could for her. The one thing she's asking her to do, Carrie won't do. But according to Scott, the intimate text messages were just the tip of the iceberg. There was a point where my father came home from work and uh, Rebecca was actually at the house uh, with my sister. And I believe they were, they were in the bathroom or the, in the shower. My dad flipped. He was not happy that his teenage daughter had her girlfriend at the house alone. Though Scott says his father's anger was nothing compared to that of their mother. She confronted Carrie with all this behavior that she was doing and basically told her that Rebecca Keller is not welcome here no more. However, Scott tells police his mother hadn't stopped there. My mother actually ended up calling the police, and Rebecca was charged with trespassing. Rebecca told me Carrie's mom put a restraining order on me. Carrie started hating her for that. It was that riff in their relationship already, but now she's trying to stop her from seeing the one she loves. The tension between Carrie and mom became just part of the pun, but you could cut it with a knife. They didn't speak to each other. It was dinner's ready, your clothes are done, that's it. You know, get up, go to school, and come home, and that's it. That's all you do. Listening to Scott Murphy, detectives are beginning to wonder if Carrie might have had a co-conspirator in her mother's murder. We turned our attention to Rebecca Keller. Rebecca being in the relationship with Carrie, having learned that Mary Ann was not pleased that this relationship was going on, that gave us a picture of a possible motive, certainly a lead that we needed to follow. Speaking with some of Rebecca Keller's friends, police confirmed that the 20-year-old had been vocally upset about the restraining order Carrie's mom placed on her. But it hadn't stopped Rebecca from figuring out a way to keep in contact with Carrie. Rebecca gave Carrie a cell phone so that the mom wouldn't know that she was talking to her. They called it the bunny phone. The news of a secret phone grabs detectives' attention. If Carrie had a cell phone, why hadn't she used it to call police on the night of the murder? 
when Carrie Murphy exits the home on the night of the murder, she goes across the street and there's a neighbor. He gives Carrie the phone to call 911. Why don't you use the phone that you have and call 911? To detectives, the most likely answer was that there was evidence on Carrie's phone that could link her or Rebecca Keller to the murder. Police doubt Carrie or Rebecca will simply hand over the phone. So they turn to Scott for help. I asked Scott, okay, do you know that number? And he said, yeah. So he gives me that phone number. I'm gonna order the phone records. On August 6th, detectives subpoena Carrie's phone records. While they wait for the request to be approved, they bring Rebecca Keller in for questioning. When detectives sit down with Rebecca, she confirms the existence of the bunny phone. But she surprises investigators when she claims that she and Carrie Murphy haven't spoken in weeks. She's acting like she's forthcoming. That, yeah, you know, we liked each other. We tried to have a relationship, but it didn't work. And that's been about a month and a half ago. I haven't talked to her since then. So I'm thinking, OK. So I'll just get a statement from her of that. I had nothing else to confront her with. So I leave. No sooner has Detective Crofton left the interview room than he receives the text records and call log from Carrie and Rebecca's bunny phone. One quick glance at them reveals a different story than what Rebecca claimed. Phone records show Carrie and Rebecca talking a lot. It's like the more that they were told they shouldn't be together and that they couldn't be together, they pushed harder to be together. The phone records also indicate that the couple had texted each other several times on the night of the murder. I see how much texting they're doing, and I know that they're texting close to the time frame of the murder. When confronted with the text records, Rebecca's entire demeanor changes. So then I start telling her, OK, well, I know that y'all were talking to each other. I know some of the conversations. I got these text messages. And she says, OK, OK. I went over there because Carrie called me and said she had killed her mom. So I went over there just to help her cover up. And I get there, Carrie's got blood all on her clothes. She tells Carrie, you know, hey, you ought to uh, make it look like a burglary. Carrie comes up with the idea, hey, I can blame it on the same. Is Rebecca Keller telling the truth? Had Carrie Murphy really acted alone when she killed her mother? A search of the internet history on Carrie's cell phone seems to corroborate at least part of Rebecca's statement. Carrie was Googling the quickest way to kill somebody. She used sleeping pills and just different methods. But the phone records also suggest that Rebecca Keller was more of a collaborator than an innocent bystander. Well, those Google searches were at the same time she's talking on the phone with Rebecca. So I know that they're scheming this together. I know that there was a plan, and they felt that they needed to get rid of Mary Ann so that they could continue their relationship. Once everything was investigated and came to light, it was clear that they were both involved in the planning. They wanted to be together, and Mary Ann stood in the way. Armed with this information, investigators charge both Carrie Murphy and Rebecca Keller with first-degree murder. Coming up, as Carrie and Rebecca's trial dates approach, investigators must wrestle with a huge unanswered question. The question in my mind was, who did the stabbing? Will the lack of a clear-cut answer jeopardize the entire case? They couldn't see outside of the box of what was going to happen. Sixteen-year-old Carrie Murphy and her 20-year-old girlfriend, Rebecca Keller, are charged with the brutal murder of Carrie's mother, Mary Ann. While the girls await trial, Carrie's family posts her bail. However, Rebecca Keller remains in jail. As both girls' trial dates grow closer, investigators still aren't sure who actually wielded the knife that took Marianne Murphy's life. 
until a series of jailhouse phone calls exposes the gruesome truth. All of these phone calls that these two girls had were recorded. Rebecca says, I'm just glad that you didn't see what happened in there. And Carrie said, I did. I was in the hallway and I looked. Rebecca says, you weren't supposed to see that. I told you to stand in your room. That let me know then that Rebecca had done the stabbing. This new information also allows prosecutors to finally put together a timeline for the murder. Carrie lets Rebecca in, tells her my mom's sleeping. Rebecca tells her, okay, wait in your room. Then Rebecca got on that bed and she proceeded to stab Mary Ann over and over and over. At some point, they decide we need to stage some scene. They break the glass. Once Rebecca is safely away, Carrie decides to make this 911 call. The couple's jailhouse phone conversations also revealed the reason they decided to kill Mary Ann on the day they did. That's where the bunny phone comes into play. Mary Ann catches Carrie lying. Mom told her, well, what's the passcode to your phone? Carrie wouldn't give her the passcode. And the mom said, well, I'm going to take this to work with me, and I know guys there that's going to get this unlocked, and I'm going to see what's going on. They knew that if what was on that phone was found out, that Rebecca would go to jail because there was sexting on there and there was pictures on there and she was too old. Carrie was like, I can't let mama get back to work with that phone. And that's when she started Googling what's the quickest way to kill somebody. And they made that plan. In December of 2012, two weeks before Carrie's 17th birthday, a judge rules that she will stand trial as an adult. But despite both Rebecca Keller and Carrie Murphy facing first-degree murder charges, neither case ever goes to trial. Rebecca entered into a guilty plea. Carrie entered a plea on her own, admitted guilt, and took what the state offered. Carrie got 30 years, and Rebecca got 60 years. What had started as a passionate romance between two teenage girls desperate to be together ends with an unthinkable murder and a loving family torn apart forever. There's never a day that goes by that I don't miss her. I miss her more than anything, but I think she was doing what she thought was right to make sure her child succeeded. But the obsession with being in love with each other drove them to do one of the darkest things that I can ever imagine. For more information, go to oxygen.com.